be alive, wouldn't you? And what an exciting time that will be um, for the rapture. Uh, I'm going to continue our series that we've been, begun a few weeks back uh, based off of the foundation of 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 17. I'm going to read that, but then also I'm going to go to 2 Peter chapter 1 for the message in verse 2 through verse 11. Peter writes, For the time is come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? Now as we look to 2 Peter chapter 1, Peter writes, Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, according as His divine power hath given us all, unto us all things that pertaineth unto life and godliness, through the knowledge of Him that hath called, you, called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And beside this, given all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ." But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off, and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Wherefore the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, ye shall never fall. For so an entrance shall be ministered to you abundantly in the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. May the Lord add his blessings to the reading of his word. I'm going to speak this morning about the growing Christian. Uh, have you ever run across somebody that you haven't seen in a while and uh, they said, well, you sure are grown up. Last time I saw you, you were just a little thing. You sure have grown up. You ever heard that statement? Um, but anyhow, uh, they used to tell me I was always real small. I, I really was. And uh, people said, well, when are you going to grow? Well, you know, but that same scenario could be flipped over to the Christian. I believe that's what Peter's saying. Peter said, listen, when are you going to grow? How are you growing? How are you developing in your faith and your walk with the Lord Jesus Christ? And I believe that every Christian ought to be a growing Christian. Matter of fact, we have no excuse today of not being a growing Christian. We have preaching today. We have teaching. We have all types of discipleship to help us grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. Uh, more probably so in this past generation than in any, any other generation. We've got internet. We've got uh, commentaries. We've got great men of wisdom uh, from all over the place that will teach us and help us. Well, is, well, Peter gives us four basic things here uh, in this uh, thing of a growing Christian we need to look at. First of all, he shows us in verse 2 through verse 5 the, the prerequisite for growth. Uh, first of all, he talks about in, in verse 2 and verse 3 the privilege in salvation. He said, grace and peace be multiplied unto you uh, through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. So in other words, he says the more knowledge you get of God and His Son, the more grace that you're going to experience. The more knowledge you get of God and, and His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, the, the more it's going to multiply. The grace and peace are going to grow and develop and you're going to be uh, the Christian that God desires for you to be. Look at that term, grace and peace be multiplied. You stop and think about your life for just a moment. Do you think about the privilege of salvation? You see, by His grace, ladies and gentlemen, He has given you salvation, not to waste, but to build off of. You've experienced His amazing grace, and because of His amazing grace, you ought to be experiencing growing grace. There ought to be a place in your life that you have absorbed the things of God, the doctrines of the Word of God. But He says grace and peace be multiplied. By the way, uh, that little phrase, grace and peace, they sort of go together. You see, the more you understand grace and realize it's something you didn't deserve, the more peace you actually obtain. 
When you realize that God has done something for you you could not do, the more peace you're going to have. Uh, and you see, when you realize the, the effects and the, the spirit of grace and peace, you won't depend so much on your works. You'll look more toward Him. He, in this prerequisite for growth, we see the privilege of in salvation. But we also see there in the next verse, verse 3, we see the power in salvation. He said, according as his, as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertaineth unto life and Godliness. Notice that little phrase, according as His divine power. You see, by His divine power, God has given you everything you need for living a godly life. Really, we're without excuse today, folks of living a godly life for the Lord Jesus Christ. The power of salvation. Salvation, uh, the power of salvation has brought this asset to us. And we need to understand that it's this power we have and these assets we have uh, are to be used for a godly life. He said, through the knowledge of Him that hath called us to glory and virtue. Let's read verse 3 again and absorb this thing. Power and salvation. According to His divine power hath given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him that hath called us to glory and virtue. We not only live by grace and peace, but we live by, uh, with glory and virtue. The power and salvation. But let's look at the promises in salvation in verse 4. Whereby, because we have experienced His grace, because we've experienced grace and peace, and because He's called us to glory and virtue, He says He has given to us exceeding great and precious promises. You know, as you pick up this book, uh, there are so many promises. Somebody said that there's, uh, they're uh, immeasurable. Some people have tried to count them, but in different books, there's different promises. Uh, somebody said there's 365 in certain books, and not one for every day. But as you think about it, notice he says exceeding and great precious promises. Why do he, does he give those precious promises? That by these, you might be partakers of the divine nature. So in other words, it's impossible for you uh, to live a godly life without these assets He's given you. He has given us His Word, the holy writings of God. He has given us these precious promises, these valuable promises. And by the way, Peter loved the word precious. He uses it continually in the book. They were just precious to him. They were valuable. They were riches to him. There was things God showed him from the Word that were so valuable and so true and so positive and so life-changing and impacting. There's nobody else that could do that or work that up. And ladies and gentlemen, there's some things God's shown me through His Word. There's some direction He's given me that no one else could have given me that direction. And they are valuable and they are treasure to me and they are to you too. But look what He says. He has given us exceeding great and precious promises but that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature. In other words, He's given you what you need to live a holy life. So we don't have any excuse not to live a holy life. We have no excuse not to live by the divine nature, unless we're not a Christian. Look what he says. That we might be partakers of divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. In other words, he says, why are these promises so precious? These promises enable you to share his divine nature and escape the world's corruption caused by human desires. Folks, you'd have to agree with me today. Our world is full. It's full of human corruption. It's full of corruption today. And the only way you're going to be able to overcome and to soar like an eagle, and the only way you're going to be able to rise above them is to live by the divine nature of God. There, and you're going to have to grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. And you have to realize that there is a prerequisite for faith or for growth, excuse me, salvation. We see the persuasion although of salvation in verse 5. He said, and beside this, it's like Peter says, and, and if that's not enough, he said, let me just say something else. And beside this, given all diligence, add to your faith virtue. And here he goes. What's he doing? You see, he's saying this, in view of the supernatural transformation of Christ in and through your life, there should be every effort in you to respond to God's promises in his word. The convincing, somebody said this, uh, uh, Kenneth Wiest said the convincing life of a Christ-like life is greater and more effective than all the learned, distinguished, distinct, 
excuse me, distinguishments and scholars in the world. Wow. One life yielded to the Lord Jesus Christ and the grace of God working in and through his or her life is more valuable than any, any scholar in the world or anybody with great disquisitions, titles, degrees, diplomas that you might know. That's what Kenneth Weiss says, and I believe that. The persuasion of salvation. He, he, he said beside this, well, let's look at the passion for growth. In verse 5 and verse 10, he said, Beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge. Notice he says, giving all diligence. All right? In other words, when you read that giving all diligence, it literally means what we might say, giving it all you got. Uh, give it all you got. Uh, and sometimes, you know, especially back in the, uh, lifting weights in high, when you were trying to max out and get a, a total weight, if you're going to max out after lifting for a while, they'd say, Go, give it all you got, and you bow you back, and you push, and you push up and bench press. You give it all you got, everything in you, you blow out and receive in, because why? You were giving it all you got. Most athletes, they're taught when it comes to a certain time and a place, uh, in, in the in competition, uh, you pace yourself, and then you get to that point, you just give it all you got. That's what he's saying here, giving all diligence. In other words, by the way, let me just insert right here. You know, when you get to that place, there are going to be some folks say, "Well, oh, man, he he's just a fanatic." She's just a fanatic. They're just into that Jesus stuff. Well, that's exactly so. That's exactly what Peter's saying. Peter said there are people going to think you're a fanatic. When you, when you get to the place of passion for growth and when you're given all diligence. But look what he says, something that's in verse 10. He says, wherefore the rather brethren give diligence. He uses a different phrase here when he's talking about diligence. He says, rather add diligence. Okay, that word give means add. He said, rather brethren add diligence. So as you think about the two differences here, what's he saying? Rather means more. He says give more diligence. You see, folks, what's he trying to show us? Spiritual growth is not automatic. Spiritual growth doesn't come naturally. There has to be a desire that's put within you of the divine nature. The divine nature has to overcome the carnal nature. The divine nature has to supersede. It has to overcome and it has to take over the carnal nature. Or yet you're going to stay in the same place you've always been and you're going to do the same thing you've always done. The passion for growth. Giving all the diligence. Uh, that, as you look at that little phrase, going back to that phrase again there, verse 5, it, it shows us that there is, has to be a positive effort. There has to be a positive effort to be made to grow. You know, common sense tells us that most of us, when we plant a garden, you have to put a little bit of effort, don't you, into getting those tomatoes to be good and juicy and to grow. I've got some tomatoes that I planted. I thought they were going to be just good. And I sort of neglected them this year. I put them up beside my building in little canisters, and I put them there with some good soil, and uh, I didn't do too much to them. I don't even know if I put miracle Girl on them. But, man, down in my garden now, i got about eight or ten plants, and, man, we've got, I mean, they're juicy. They're just right. Tomato, Duke's mayonnaise, salt and pepper on good, fresh sunbeam bread. It's like a hog-eating slop. I mean, just good. You there with me? Say Amen. But you go up those tomatoes and there's two little bitty old things, just little little runts. And I'm thinking, when are these little things going to grow? And, and I've seen people plant those tomatoes and they just go everywhere. And you, they're just uh, everywhere. I mean, just oodlings of them. And you can't get enough. But I think I've got three total off of two plants. You know why? Because I neglected them. I done nothing to add fertilizer to them. I done nothing to nurture them. Done nothing to make them grow. Matter of fact, there's so many times I forgot to water them. There's so many times that they weren't really in the sunlight where they needed to absorb sun. They were in the shadow of the building. And let me just say, as long as you live in the shadows of somebody else, you live in the shadows of this world, and you're, there's no, going to be no development and there'll be no growth. And that's exactly what Peter's saying. Peter's saying, listen, spiritual growth is not automatic. There has to be some nurturing. There has to be some effort made in order to grow. And I'm afraid today that's where we've left so many Christians, or young, young Christians. We have to challenge them to, uh, to grow. There has to be effort. Effort has to be made to develop them and to grow them, but that doesn't excuse them from their efforts of themselves. 
Why? Because they're battling with the flesh. They're battling with the world and all the voices. And they need to know the, the passion for growth. But let me look at the third thing here in the Scripture is we see the places of growth. Notice what he says. There's some places where we have to grow. We need to grow. We must develop. We can't live in the shade all the time. Notice he uses a word here, add. And it's like, he, it's like Peter's almost like charismatic. He, did, he says, it's a run-on sentence. There's some commas, but he goes on. It's a, he says, listen. <laughs> he said, beside this, given all diligence, add to your faith virtue and add to your virtue knowledge and add to knowledge and temperance and to temperance patience and to patience goodness and to godliness brotherly kindness and to brotherly kindness charity. Linking word, just keep on. It's like I, Peter says, you got this, you're going to have this, got to have this, got to have this, got to have this. But what are these things? See, spiritual growth. He says, add. In other words, that little word add in, in the Greek text literally means to, it means to add generously. To add generously. Now, some of you know what I'm talking about here. Well, I went to that diabetic class. And I've done pretty good, but they give me this plate. And, and this plate, it had a big section and it had two little sections. And they said, your meat needs to be this size. Everything you need, everything you need to eat is going to fit in one of these three compartments. And every time Renee's not watching, you know what I do? I fill that thing up just a little bit bigger in one of them compartments. She tries to help me. Now, I'm pretty honest. I'm just kidding. But uh, she, no, I'm not. <laughs> I was waiting on that. But it's what he's talking He says, listen. It means to supply generously. Man, when I eat mashed potatoes, I want to eat mashed potatoes generously, don't you? I mean, mashed potatoes, praise God, there's nothing like them. I mean, full carb, 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 carb heaven. And, and it's, very, it's hard to get them in that little old compartment. But I've learned a secret. If any of y'all tried this, you pile them higher. They might not fit in the round, but they pile generously. But that's what he's talking about, supply generously. Uh, places of growth. We need, to, we, need to, we need to supply ourselves generously. There's some things we have to take the initiative and generously add to our lives. What are they? He uses the first term here. He says, uh, given all diligence. Pay attention to what you're adding. Right? The word diligence. Again, uh, take these things and make an effort to use them to grow. Uh, to give it all you got. To be sure you put these in your life. He says, add to your faith virtue. Uh, that ver word virtue just means moral excellence. Moral excellence. You ought to want to live right because you serve God. You ought to want to live right because you love Jesus. You ought to live right. You ought to keep His commandments not because you have to, because you want to. Because you know it's going to break the heart of God if you sin against God. Amen. Amen. Uh, he says, <laughs> add to your faith virtue. For we live in a, a, a generation that's lost total virtue today. Uh, there's no moral excellence. Anything goes today. You name it, it's acceptable. Not according to this word. Amen? Moral excellence. Knowledge in verse 5. And to virtue, knowledge. Notice he's linking all these things together. Knowledge. This practical knowledge or discernment is what he's talking about here. In other words... He's saying that you must not separate the heart and the mind. The heart and the mind have to work together. And by the way, your mind can be deceived and your heart can be deceived. Uh, the writer of Proverbs said your heart can be is deceivingly wicked. In other words, you have to mind and the, the heart have to work together. There has to be control. There has to be knowledge. And let me just say the Holy Spirit and the Word of God is the only thing going to help you to avoid those things out there that will entangle you. Then he uses the word temperance here. Uh, and add to knowledge, temperance. And temperance just means self-control. Every one of us, whether we want to realize or not, we have struggled with self-control. When I drive by Krispy Kreme, my steering wheel, if I don't control it, it starts vibrating and want to turn in. You been there? Amen. It's real. Self-control. When you walk by that place and they got corn, uh, cream horns and uh, we went in a place other they didn't even know they had dessert in a district store. And all of a sudden we walk in there and my goodness, they got a counter as long as this stage. It had cream horns, it had donuts, it had honey buns, it had cinnabon, it had everything you wanted. I mean, it was a diner's heaven. But my self-control took over. I said, honey, I can't do this, we got to go. 
And we grabbed what we got and we went on. I got a bag of pork skin, I think, and a drink and I went out the door. You know why? Because I knew if I hung around there long enough, one of them cream horns is going to get sucked down. Amen? It's just going to evaporate and I wouldn't be able to explain it. Temperance. Folks, we, got, we, need, to raise, we, we, need, we need a generation today that has self-control. You know why? Because we've got so many things today, we've, we haven't had to struggle a whole lot. And I'm not talking about just eating. I'm talking about habits. I'm talking about things that we're involved in today. Self-control. Our attitudes, our personalities, and all types of other things would entangle us and cause us to sin and ruin our testimony. Then he mentioned, he mentioned add patience. Uh, patience is just the ability to endure when circumstances are difficult. We've seen, we've seen that recently, haven't we? Uh, the pressures and problems of your life, uh, they can't cause you to cave in spiritually. That's what he's saying. He said, don't let the cares and, the, and the, the problems and the pressures of life cause you to cave in spiritually. Satan loves that. And then he says, add godliness. That word godliness, it really means godlikeness. But here's the thing. It not only means God likeness, but it also portrays in the in the Greek it it, it portrays to it means to worship well. In other words, if you're going to worship well and you're going to have God likeness, you're going to have to live above the petty things of life. That's what he's saying. Living above the petty things of life. If you're going to live in God likeness, there's some petty things you'll have to. Overcome. And then he uses the term brotherly kindness. Add brotherly kindness. Just be kind. Uh, people are so rude today. And even, even when they have a mask on, you can see their eyes. They're not fooling anybody. Uh, yesterday, just minding my own business, we were riding. And I was going to turn left a lot, and I was going to go about halfway so that flow of traffic would go. And as a lady started, had a convertible, and I don't know what her problem was. I was just sitting there waiting to turn left. I had my signal on. I mean, she flipped out. She went off on me. I don't know what she said, but it wasn't nice. It wasn't Greek or Hebrew. I think it was some other language. But anyhow, I said, what in the world? And they said, what would you do? I said, I don't know. I said, goodness gracious. I mean, she was just bent out of shape. You know, the sad thing about it is she might have been a professing Christian. Some folks say the most unkind people that they experience are Christians. Do you know if you took a poll today of most of the restaurants on Sunday, the waitress would tell you the rudest customers are Christians. They dread working more on Sunday than any other day because of the attitudes of people who profess to know Christ. That's recorded. That's the truth. Brotherly kindness. Just be kind to one another. Why is it so hard? You see, the person that's not growing is not going to be interested in doing these things I mentioned. Then he says charity. That, the last one was charity. God's love. It, it's hard. Here's the thing. If you're not experiencing God's love, and exp you're not going to be expressing God's love. Amen. If you're not experiencing God's love, you're not going to be able to express brotherly love. That's why he says that. He puts the icing on the cake. Well, let's move on. Look at verse 8 through verse 11. We see the product of growth. There's three evidences of spiritual growth in every believer's life. Three evidences. First of all, number one, look at verse 8. There's going to be fruitfulness. He said, "For the, if these things be in you and abound, if they're working, if they're, they're involved and they're working, they make you that you shall be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. He says the more you grow like this, the, the more productive and useful you'll be in your knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. The more you're going to reflect Him, the more you know about Him. Look what He says, if these things be in you, these characteristics He just mentioned, you're not going to be barren. You're not, going, you're not going to run on empty. You're not going to be unfruitful in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Because God's going to give you more knowledge of Himself when these things begin to develop and grow in your life. There's going to be fruitfulness. Secondly, there's going to be vision. Look what he says in verse 9. But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. 
You see, those who fail to grow will be short-sighted or blind, forgetting that they've been cleansed from their old sins. You remember what the Lord Jesus said in Revelation 3, in verse 17, the Laodicean church, He says, you're wretched, you're naked, and you're blind. And the sad thing about it is you can't see your condition. Well, it's a dangerous place to lose your vision of what God's done in your life. It's a dangerous thing to lose the vision of what God is doing in your life. And it's even more dangerous to miss out on what God wants to do in your life. I've been there and I speak from experience. And I never want to go back to that place in my life. And if you're there this morning, let me encourage you today, don't stay there. Because you'll get blinder and you'll become blinder. And you'll become blinder to what God wants out of your life if you allow it to take place. Vision. Those who fail to grow will be short-sighted or blind, forgetting they've been cleansed from their old sins. You see, it's not a very big step to depart from God. But it's much bigger the longer it goes and the further it goes. Then the third thing he writes here is he speaks of security. Security. The product of growth is not only fruitfulness and vision, but it's security. Look at verse 10, verse 11. He says, Wherefore the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your call and election sure. For if you do these things, you shall never fall. Now, he didn't say that you wouldn't fail God. We've all failed God after we've been saved. But look what he says. What, he said, brethren, give diligence. Give diligence. Now, Look what he says. He says, give diligence. There it is again. <laughs> to make your calling and your election sure. In other words, make sure you're saved to start with. And if you do these things, if you add these things after salvation, you'll never fall. For so an entrance shall be ministered to you abundantly in the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Now, let's get a picture of what he's trying to close out here with. He's talking about security. He, he, he uses the same word add in verse 5. Okay, The same word add is the same Greek word ministered in verse 11. What does it mean? In other words, it goes back to a word, this word ministered meant someone had to underwrite the expense of a Greek theater production uh, in which the expenses were very great. And the Word made, uh, make lavish provision to grow in your faith is literally what it meant. In other words, God will do the same thing, same thing for you when, when we enter heaven. There's going to be a lavish celebration. There's going to be a great celebration for those who are in the Lord Jesus Christ. When you enter the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, your entrance is going to be a lavish presentation. It's going to be an event like other. Why not work on that event while you're here? Is what he's saying. Why not do everything you can to honor Christ now? Why not do everything you can to grow in your Christian life so that when you stand before Him, you can stand before Him in confidence? Well... The Christian life begins with faith, but it must lead to spiritual growth. The only problem hindering it from doing that is one thing, and it's dead faith. Dead faith will hinder a person from growing spiritually in his or her life. Let me ask you this morning as you sit in this building, do you need to put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ today to be your personal Savior? You see, it's, you can't add to a faith you don't have. Why not start by putting faith today in Jesus Christ? So many folks scratch their head and say, well, why do I keep doing that? Why, do I, why am I living like that? You know, uh, what, and, and on and on they go because they've never trusted Christ. And there's nothing to take care of that natural man that's battling him or her all the day long. Maybe you're here today and you're, already, you're a Christian. Are you adding to your faith this morning? Are you growing? Are you adding to your faith so you can grow? If I were to ask you today, where are you investing in your life? Would you say in His Word? If I were to ask you what you're investing your life in, 
Is it in the Lord Jesus Christ? Is it in spiritual things? If you did a measure today of your life, how many things in the average week would be spiritual? How many things as you analyze your life would be to suit the world? How many things would be for yourself instead of Jesus? That's a sobering question, isn't it? For some, all we give Him sometimes is 15 or 20 minutes on Sunday and then we forget about Him. You're never going to add to your faith like that. You're never going to grow in maturity till you make the decision that you're going to grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. And by the way, when tragedy comes, when crisis comes, it's going to be grace and peace that will see you through. And there's no way that grace and peace can be multiplied if you don't have a knowledge of God through His Son, Jesus Christ, that you need to have. I see so many people, I'm going to close, they come to a crisis in their life, a time of death, time of sickness, life's days, and they have no peace. They have no grace because they've never invested any time or effort in the relationship with Jesus Christ. They take Scripture out of context. They say stuff that they've heard along the way that are not really in the Bible. And all of a sudden, they're facing a crisis because they haven't invested their time and their efforts in a relationship with Jesus Christ the way they should have. I want to challenge you today. As I think about judgment beginning at the house of God,